शांति 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 There are people we tend to find more of them in the west than we do in India we tend to find more of them in the world of science than in the world of other things who say that the whole spirituality god spirit soul energy all of all of this stuff that we talk about in spirituality that it's all made up that it's all just a f- figment of our imagination you could say that we have created it and and what to what to say to people like that well here's what's interesting on the very deepest 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 level ironically they are right meaning that our inner world creates our outer world this is the same thing that the sages and the rishis and the saints have been telling us that as our inner world is so is our outer world so on the absolute most fundamental level they're right but that's not really what they're talking about what they're saying is not so much the depth of our inner world creates our outer reality but that you've made it up as you said to deal with fears to deal with so many other things that this is just a figment of your imagination not the co-creation with the universe that the sages and saints talk about you know the issue with proving this stuff is something that comes up really frequently in here because you can't there isn't a way within the confines of science to prove beyond a doubt spirituality yes there are books we can say okay these people have had past life experiences we've got evidence over here evidence over there you can you get anecdotal evidence this miracle that miracle this you whatever it may be but spirit and spirituality does not confine itself to the world of science and this is really where the dilemma comes in is that our proof only counts as proof if it falls within the realm of science so the same people who are saying to us you've invented it are the same people who have made the rules and the boundaries So they've said you've made it up. If you haven't made it up, prove it to me, but prove it to me according to the laws and the rules and the boundaries and the tools and the measures I'm going to give you. And so they've really made us kind of stuck in an interesting sort of way. So science has said, here are the valid ways of knowing. Your five senses So if you can actually see it if you can smell it if you can hear it if you can touch it if you can taste it it's provable because of course our senses work through very physical measures we know how we can see things for example you can take a a class in perception that will explain to you about how light falls on the retina and the rods and the cones and how it goes through our optic nerve and I won't go into it here but we know scientifically how the world in front of us is seen by us we know how the world is heard by us in our outer ear in our inner ear into the brain we know how taste works it's all got physical substrates here's what the frequency is whether it's a light frequency or a sound frequency and then science says so here are the, those are the ways of knowing 
your five senses. What are the ways of measuring? Weight. Can you put it on a scale? What's its weight? Volume or area, depending on what it is you're measuring. Height, width, color. So these are, these are the, the ways that we know and the tools that we've got. Can you see it in a microscope? Okay, fine, your naked eye can't see it. Can a microscope see it? Or can a telescope see it? If something does not conform to those tools and ways of knowing, it's considered by science to be basically invalid. And this is the, the catch-22 situation that we're in because by definition, spirituality doesn't. What spirituality says is something like this. The lowercase t truth, so something that is true in terms of here and now, in this place, in this time, are things that can be weighed, measured, observed, understood through our five senses. So, for example, it is hot now. True. Lowercase t truth, as in... It's not an eternal truth. It's not true in the North Pole right now. It's not true here in January. But in this place, in this time, it is hot truth. This is wet. Okay. My finger is wet. True. Lowercase t true. This place, this time. In five minutes, it will no longer be true. My finger will dry. Five minutes ago, it wasn't true. So what spirituality says is lowercase t truth is that truth which basically is knowable by the five senses. You're seeing something, now it's true. You are in front of me. That is true. But it's lowercase t truth because two hours from now, you won't be. Two hours before this, you weren't. All of that falls into the lowercase t truth category. It's not a lie. It's just not highest level, capital T, eternal truth. The capital T, eternal truth is stuff that cannot, by definition, be subject to the senses because the senses change. So, for example, if I can't see you, if I go blind, you don't cease to exist just because I can't see you. Now, if you speak or sing or breathe loudly, even if I'm blind, I can still know you're there because I can hear you. If you've got a strong scent, I can smell you. But if I can't use my senses to know you, you still exist. But my senses have changed. And what that, what that makes us know is that our senses are only able to give us a very, a very fine finely bordered, you could say, experience of the truth. And all that is eternal, by definition, cannot be through my senses. All that is eternal cannot be something that you have to weigh or measure. I'll give you an example. 200 years ago, if you took a science class, and in that science class, you wrote... The earth is flat and everything revolves around it. You would be marked true, correct, A plus. That was true. Now, we know it wasn't true, true, but because the tools of science 
had not yet gotten to the point where we are today, the truth that was being taught with all good intentions, the best that their tools up to that point had been able to measure were the earth is flat, it is the center of the universe. Tools got better. What did we discover? Ah, Earth is not flat, it's round. Ah, actually we are not quite so much the center of the universe. Actually we are revolving around the sun. So the capital T truth cannot by definition be something that is dependent upon our tools. Because that truth keeps changing. 200 years from now, who knows what's going to be truth? They're going to look back and laugh. Ha ha, 200 years ago, if you had said the earth was round, you would have gotten an A on your exam. 200 years ago, if you had said the earth revolved around the sun, you got an A. Ha ha, isn't that funny? Right? And they, they'll laugh the same way that today we're laughing that people thought the earth was flat. Because as our tools change, so, so does our truth. But... Capital T truth, spirit, soul, divinity, doesn't, doesn't abide by those rules. And what that means is that we cannot use those measures for it. So as long as science is going to dictate the language of the debate, the types of evidence that we are allowed to present in the debate, that which counts as valid, that which doesn't count as valid. There's no way you can prove it. And so there's no point even getting into one of those conversations. All you can do is two things that I have discovered so far. If anybody has discovered anything else, I'm open to lots of suggestions here. Two things I've discovered. Number one, ask them if they've ever been in love. And then ask them to prove it to you. Tell them you don't believe them, that you think it was an entirely figment of their imagination. See what happens. See what they come up with. Because beautifully, love also being one of the most important things in the world along with soul and spirit and God, it's all the same, also can't be weighed or measured or seen with any of the tools or known by any of our senses. And yet, thankfully, by God's grace, most people have had the opportunity to experience love at some point in their life. Ideally, they're even still experiencing it in this moment if not with a person, maybe with a pet, maybe with a tree, whatever it may be. But if anybody has ever experienced love, they're going to get immediately your analogy. And if they are prepared to accept that love, which they cannot prove, still is valid, then you've got your foot in the door. It opens up a whole new world to the fact that something could at least be real, be valid, be even more valid than the truth that keeps changing as our tools change, simply because we know it. Because that's the answer people give. How do you know you're in love? I just, I know it. I feel it. I experience it. It's my truth. Well, yeah, so how do you know there's God? I feel it. I know it. In the same way that you know when you're in love. Even more so. Because sometimes you fall in love and then you fall out of love. And, you know, it tends to happen sometimes with love. But it doesn't happen with God. The other piece of that that I would say is... Don't let people like that get you down. Up until the point where you enjoy the debate. I know for me, I always have fun with it. My, my connection with God is so, so deep and so strong that I'm perfectly prepared to engage in a 
conversation about it with anybody because it doesn't, it doesn't shake me or disturb me. And you always feel like, well, maybe there's a possibility of touching somebody, of bringing new light to them. Because science has done a phenomenal job of brainwashing us into believing that they really have a monopoly on truth. And we've really been indoctrinated to believe that. And science is fantastic. I love it. I'm a science student. It's great. It gives us these lights. It gives us the fans. It gives us the cameras. It gives us his computer. It gives us everything. But what it can't do is include things that are out of its jurisdiction, which isn't its fault. It's not a shortcoming of science. Not every field can do everything. But science, for some reason, is, is the one field that has really claimed jurisdiction over everything. I mean, literature would never say, if it's not written in a book, if it's not in iambic pentameter somewhere, it doesn't exist. If it's not in our card catalog, it doesn't exist. They would never say that. Literature understands we are a field. Art would never say, if somebody's never painted it, it doesn't exist. Music would never say, ah, oh, if there's no song about it, it doesn't exist. But science somehow has decided that not only is it going to be a fantastic field in and of itself, but it's going to claim jurisdiction over all of truth. And I'm not quite sure historically how that happened. I find it interesting and sad. It literally would be like literature saying, if it's not in iambic pentameter, it doesn't exist. Or if it hasn't been published, it doesn't exist. Which we would immediately understand, well, that's a joke. Obviously, there's truth that, doesn't, that hasn't been published yet. But science has done a very good job of brainwashing us. So have the conversation for as long as you can. It's important for those of us who have experienced something outside the realm of science to be open about sharing it with others. But do it to the point where, you st where you've got your energy inside you and you can give. When you feel yourself drained of energy, make sure you go back and recharge your batteries. Okay? And the, the second point. So one is we ask them if they've ever been in love. Two things to do in these situations. One, ask them about love. Number two, simply pray for them. Simply pray for them that they will have an experience of the divine. Because once they do, the debate is over. You know, it's like kids come home from school and say, I actually once had a little debate with a young boy who said God doesn't exist, and you know, and he was about eight, and he said, also we discussed the fact, I asked him about girls, and he said, oh no, girls have the cooties, girls are gross, he's never going to get married, and, and when we had our debate, his whole family was there some of his older siblings, whom, miraculously, he had managed to convince about the God thing. They had all sort of become a team about God doesn't exist, and the older ones had been reading books about God doesn't exist. And when I pointed out how he also thought that girls had cooties, and that girls were gross, and that he was never going to want to be with a girl, and never going to get married, of course, at which point his older siblings sort of blushed and giggled and, you know, did the things that teenagers do when people talk about being in love. And 
I said to them, well, so what do you think about this? You think that's true? And they're like, oh, no, no, he'll, he'll grow up. He'll, he'll, it'll happen to him too someday. And I said, well, this is exactly, exactly what you have to do with someone who has this feeling about God, is simply have the faith that they too someday will have the experience of connecting with God. In the same way that we know this eight-year-old is going to fall in love someday and have the experience. and So there's no point debating him on the love issue. There's no point trying to convince him that girls really don't have cooties and they're really not gross and that someday he too will fall in love. Rather than that, you just sit back and you smile and you pray and you wait. And that's what we do with people in the spirituality thing. So you just, you pray. And if they'll let you, you bring them to places. You take them to places. You give them experiences in which, hopefully by God's grace, they'll have a spiritual experience. So that they too will know. Because the brain cannot convince the spirit. We're operating on two completely different levels of existence. So don't try to convince them with reason, with logic. Just try to help them have an experience. Help them stay open to having an experience.